Being Hello out there on the internet, I am Matthew Galt, and this is Cyber. You know, without sex, there would be no internet. From the moment the server spun up, users were trying to figure out how to, how, how to use instant connection to pleasure themselves and each other. The history of sex and the internet are intertwined, and what feels like new problems in the space, banking woes, hate speech, harassment, and moral panics about children, are all much, much older than you think. That is the subject of the new book, How Sex Changed the Internet. It's out next week, on November 15th to be exact, and it's by Motherboard Senior Editor Samantha Cole, and she's here with us today to talk about breasts, BBSs, boys clubs, and the broad strokes of the culture war. Sam, thank you so much for coming on to the show and walking us through this. Thanks for having me, as always. All right, so... You and I both grew up online in the very specific, like, early days of the internet. Um, And there's a large part of, like, the portion, the beginning portion of this book that is kind of about that. Like, what that world looked like and how it felt and what it was like to be there. So can you kind of set that scene? What what were your earliest experiences online like? Yeah, I um, I was just telling someone the other day that uh, I remember getting like the little like the AOL discs in like cereal boxes and how we just had like so many of those just lying around. Um, we my household got online probably a little later than my peers. Um, I'm 33 and like I think we got online when it was probably I mean I was maybe 11 or 12 um, and you know, we, the first thing I did was log on to the Nickelodeon website (laughs) Um, because I'd been seeing it like advertised everywhere on TV and stuff. And they'd have these little like activations, like go online to read more about this, like, you know, play a game about the TV show. Um, And I feel like I was missing out on like this whole other like universe of things happening. Um, So getting online was very exciting. And also like, you know, I was very much still a kid. (laughs) And yeah, I guess from there, it kind of the world of like talking to other people, other like strangers online opened up and not even like in a creepy way, just in like a very, I mean, my experience was very like wholesome and, um, you know, it was just like people from around the world who wanted to talk about like theology and world events and things like that. And, you know, I was homeschooled, so I, um, really just wanted like a social life with people um, who are outside of like my direct, like, you know, purview. So um, yeah, it, it was definitely uh, an eye-opening experience, I guess, at first, but it was also just like really fucking fun. Um, and just, you know, like every, around every corner, there was something new to do. I did a lot of like flash games. Like that was my big thing. And then in between that, I was like emailing my friends who I had met on like message boards. <laughs> Um, yeah. Did your family kind of know what was going on there? Were they ever worried? I mean, it was so, everything was so new, right? Yeah, everything was super new. And like, I mean, we had like the big computer in the computer room, like in the den. Um, so it's like, it was always like in the room, like, you know, fa- like the screen faced like the couch so they could see if they wanted to what I was doing. But they also didn't really like, not that I'm aware, maybe they'll hear me say some of this stuff and they'll be like, yeah, we were watching everything you did and you didn't know. Um, but I didn't feel like monitored. I felt like they were just kind of not interested in like the kind of stuff I was doing online. Um, I think they trusted me to not give my address out to strangers. (laughs) Um, but yeah, it was, you know, when you have the computer room, it's like things changed when I got a laptop and then that was much later that was like in high school. Um, and I could, you know, be on the internet in my room. Um, it's a different story. Yeah, we had the we had it in the office, so it wasn't in the family room. Yeah. Um, and I had friends that had I had a friend that had a big family, and it was in the family room. And I remember his little brother was always on there playing StarCraft. <laughs> um, and so there was just like a part of the living room was just a, a like a twelve year old playing StarCraft constantly. <laughs> that sounds right. Yeah, I mean that was me. Like even before the internet, like we had the computer just in the living room, like playing like DOS games and like, you know, just little games that I would just spend all day doing. Um, so I was already like interested in how like computers worked and like what was going on with that. And then with the internet, it was like, oh shit, like this is for something completely different. 
um, that I had no idea about until now. How did you, I'm sorry, I know this question wasn't in the, the pre-roll, but now it just occurred to me. Like, how yeah. did you develop this? Because you are the person that writes about sex on the internet for Vice. Yeah. Um, for Motherboard. You're great at it. You approach it with this, like, incredible empathy I don't see um, in a lot of this space. There's a lot of, like, sensationalist reporting kind of about it in a lot of... Um, like leering, I guess. Yeah. Uh, you kind of do the opposite. Like, how did you get involved in this beat? Like, what was it that interested you? And what were some of those early stories that you covered? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I started at Motherboard as a freelancer and was doing a lot of just like hard science stuff and also like just kind of like the pop news stuff of the day. Um, but then, uh, Emmanuel and Jason, our editors at Motherboard, um, they were like, would you be interested in doing more of like sex and gender stuff? Because we don't currently have someone. And that was, you know, five or six years ago. We don't have someone, um, on staff doing that currently. Um, and I was like, yeah, like I've been doing tech reporting for a while. Like I'm definitely game for whatever as like, you know, a freelancer slash new staff writer. <laughs> it's like, sure. That sounds fun to do for a while. Um, and I think something that they, they told me at first and stuck with me was, um, you know, and Motherboard's a, a tech site. And, um, I was like, well, this is, this seems kind of adjacent. Um, and they were like, porn and sex on the internet is tech. Like it, that's, that is what it is. Um, and it should be covered as such. So, um, yeah, just kind of approaching it in a way that like, other reporters might approach writing about like Facebook or Google um, with the same degree of seriousness and like um, taking it in that way uh, was really helpful just from the start. You know, it was never like a joke. It was always like, this is a real um, huge industry and it needs to be treated that way. And I'm far from the first person to treat this beat that way, but um, advice specifically, I think, um, they just, they needed someone to kind of fill that gap. And yeah, I mean, it's, you know, they, they gave me the best, the best beat in journalism, in my opinion, or at least in tech, because everything that happens in the adult industry happens to sex workers and people who are working on like sex and gender first. Um, so, you know, you're seeing it happen before it happens to the rest of us, to the rest of the mainstream, um, which I think is a huge advantage just in tech reporting in general. Yeah, that was one of my big takeaways from the from the book. And I think one of the first times I remember seeing it happen in real time uh, was the deep fakes. Yeah. Right? Because this is a thing that we now kind of associate with, you know, disinformation and funny videos where a guy kind of looks like Tom Cruise and is then made to look like Tom yeah. Cruise completely. But it started, it started out much uh, different. Uh, mm -hmm. And we'll get to the past here in a second, but I'm just following the thread of the conversation. Uh, yeah. Can you kind of, can I think that that's a good like starting point for how prescient uh, like yeah. sex on the internet can be. Can you tell that story? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, with deep fakes, that was one of the first really, um, really big stories on like a national level that I ended up doing on this beat. Um, uh, so yeah, deep fakes was obviously like first created, uh, the technology was created to put people's faces into porn, um, obviously without people's consent um so yeah the the first like people i talked to for the deep fake story um, i would say i talked to like ethical ai researchers and people like that but i also um talked to the people who were in the videos which were porn performers and um you know they were the ones with their bodies getting you know other people's faces uh pasted onto them too and i think that was something that was getting missed then in the following coverage was you know yes this is like a violation of like scarlett johansson's privacy or whatever because her face is on that body but it's also that's someone's body still like that's a that's a performer's body that's their work that's their livelihoods like you know that's being stolen too um so i think yeah that that was definitely um that is a good example of like you know the ways that these issues affect people in the adult industry first um so yeah that's that was god that was a long time ago what was that, like 2017? Something like that. It was a, yeah, because I feel like it, it kind of kicked off like right after the 2016 election. Um, yeah. So yeah. I remember there was a lot of tut-tutting and concern about it being used as a, yeah. 
uh, in in politics. And that mm-hmm. conversation was happening at the same time that the use case was mostly pornography, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, all right, let's let's go way back to before our times uh, to the bulletin board services. Yeah. Um, what for for those of us that don't know, like what is a bulletin board service? Uh, how did they spring up and like what was happening there that presages like almost everything else you're going to talk about in your book? Yeah, yeah. So bulletin board systems were um, before even I mean it systems was pre- not services. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I mean, you know, it's the same meaning, but, uh, yeah, they, um, they were, um, these like, uh, ways that people could talk to each other through phone, uh, connecting to a phone modem line. Um, and yeah, that, that predates, you know, the World Wide web, all of this stuff. Um, and people just wanted to kind of connect to other people who were interested in the same stuff a lot of the time. Uh, that's what people used it for. Um, it was pretty local because it was, you know, phone lines. So uh, to connect long distance was expensive. Um, but yeah, people were just kind of running them from their own houses, like from their own servers. Um, and then they would, you know, open it up to everyone who was interested. And you could just call in and like tell them you want to log in. And then they would, you know, put you in the in the system and you could use your computer to talk to people across distance, which was like huge um at the time and this was i mean they were invented in like i think the late 70s um so yeah that that kind of predates everything that that we see happening with the internet today because they were dealing with the same kind of stuff like what can people say on here like how do we make this a friendly space and an open space and not um you know not tolerate like hate speech and it was not a ton of that because it was so um which was a barrier so to entry, local. Right? It was, yeah, it was people who mostly like trusted each other. It was you know, it was a community of people who were into the same stuff. So it wasn't just like trolls. Um, yeah. So I think BBS, uh, the BBS era, was really precious <laughs> in my like glossy hindsight view. Obviously, I wasn't there, so like maybe it was more um, you know corrosive than it seems in hindsight or like the way that people, you know, I'm trusting people to tell me the way it was. And I think, uh, you know, people remember things maybe a little more rosy than they, um, were at the time, but you know, the people were dealt with the same things like, you know, can we talk about, uh, sex on here? Can we set up one that's just about like sexual expression? And then people would fight about that, you know? Um, so it's the same kind of thing. Just, you know, you're still dealing with humans over the years. So. So there's this undercurrent in the book uh, that I thought was really fascinating, which is the AIDS crisis. Mm -hmm. Can you, we don't, some people kind of don't remember that history now, I think, but like in the the eighties, like this was, it was kind of, you were at this time when uh, like LGBT people were just kind of starting to get, um, assert their rights. And this disease comes along and becomes associated in the minds of the public with with that community. Um, and it was really hard to get like real information about what you should do and what was going on. Um, mm-hmm. And at the same time, online communities are just starting to form. Um, and you've got you kind of have like these little uh, these little chunks about it kind of spread throughout the book. So can you tell me about like, Sister Mary Elizabeth Clark and some of the other yeah like signposts or uh, uh, ways that information was spread at the yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah, it's so interesting that you picked up on that um, as kind of a through line because I didn't even realize that that was a through line and it totally is. <laughs> I mean, I kind of I realized that like, you know, like harm reduction in community is a huge part of the early internet. Um so yeah, like you said like a uh, Sister Mary Elizabeth Clark um she uh, was a trans woman that um, set up a bulletin board system that became uh, one of the biggest um, AIDS information hubs for people. Um, so she had met someone who was in like a really rural community and didn't have access to even just like healthcare for AIDS. Um, and this person was closeted and like, obviously their family was not supportive of any of this and, um, they were really suffering. And, uh, sister Mary Elizabeth Clark was like, 
we got to like connect this person to some help um, beyond like picking up the phone, because even that was like opening him up to um, scrutiny from like family and, you know, operators and things like that. Um, so, you know, these, these kind of services were really life-saving for people because they could talk to uh, other people like about what they were going through. So just like mentally being able to like feel less alone and also just in a tangible way, physically being able to find care and, um, you know, figure out how to kind of, uh, you know, reduce some of the, the pain that they were in. So um, yeah, the, we also, um, I mean, in the book I talk about, um, AOL as like a, a harm reduction, um, kind of service. <laughs> so there were like, um, these, uh, kind of pushes from public health, uh, organizations that would go into like gay AOL chat channels and, you know, share information about, um, how to like have safer sex and how to kind of spot the signs of like, you know, STIs and things like that. And it was really kind of remarkable to see this, you know, in retrospect, see this happening because you realize how, um, you know, you take for granted today, Google and things like that, being able to just say, you know, I can look up every little ailment I have. Um, and I think we take that very much for granted today. <laughs> Even to even today, I think the 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 quality of the medical information that's on Google and other places it yeah. can be it can be really hard to fucking discern. Yeah, like like even for us who have like a pretty practiced eye at figuring out like what's bullshit and what's not. Like mm -hmm. like if I'm looking something up medical or nutrition or anything like that on the internet, it's a nightmare. It's an absolute yeah. nightmare. You're always gonna like WebMD is always gonna tell you you're dying of cancer yeah. or something like. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And I, yeah, the 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 trans activist techno nun, uh, what you call her <laughs> in the book. Uh, I just want to highlight this because I think it was so fascinating. Um, in 1999, the 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 site is getting 25 million hits a month, mm -hmm. and she is working 18 hours a day to keep it updated. And she's uploading medical journals, articles, studies, um, all of this unpaid. This is just yeah. What she's doing, yeah, she's it's strictly like an act of love, is what she says. Yeah. Um, I thought that was incredible that even like to have that kind of traffic in 1999 to be doing that kind of work. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, and this is just one of those like this. This is a page in the book. The book is filled with these stories I've never heard that are completely fascinating. That really kind of paint a picture of the infrastructure that was built. Uh, in the early days of the internet and how sex was an integral part of it, which is so funny now because, I mean, it still is, but like there's this constant pushback now, yeah. right? Um, yeah. And I think one of the earliest instances of the pushback is I have the Time Magazine cover from 1995 is like burned into my memory. Um, <laughs> I, I may, I'm going to try to pull it up while you answer this question. Can you tell us about kind of, and maybe this is unfair to call it the first great moral panic about sex on the internet, but one of the early moral panic, maybe the first mainstream yeah. moral panic about sex on the internet, uh, Time Magazine's cover in 1995. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, there was this kind of, uh, I mean, it was a study that got debunked very quickly by people using um, like Usenet and uh bbs and all that stuff um but the study claimed um that there was all this porn on the internet that kids could see and it was all like violent and horrific illegal stuff um and it turned out to be completely like unverifiable I, he was like doing all these like shady research practices i wouldn't even call them research practices they were just like you know um basing like images basing what was in what was in an image on the file name, which is completely like, you know, says nothing about what was actually in the image. He wasn't taking the time to download stuff. So anyway, this research um, caught the eye of a reporter at time, um, or, you know, it got kind of fed to this reporter at time by the, the guy who was trying to like get attention for it. Um, and time was like, oh my God, we have this crisis of like porn <laughs> on the internet um, that, you know, kids can see. What about the kids? What about the children? So it's always, you know, save the children type of um, 
rhetoric that gets used to kind of push these bunk claims. Um, it's such a good, I've got it pulled up now. It's such yeah. a, like the haunted look of a child, <laughs> like a very young child, right? Yeah. Yeah. Just like with like the fingers over the keyboard. Um, you know, they, what are they seeing? You know, something grotesque. <laughs> Surely. Uh, yeah. So this kind of created like this huge kind of panic about like what are kids looking at on the internet? Like we don't know what's out there. Um, so this kind of became a huge thing for um, legislators who wanted more censorship of the internet. Um, it was uh, kind of, it was used as a, a talking point um, to get more censorship in the early days of the internet. Um, yeah, just a mess. <laughs> please, please, please tell us what the name of the study was, too. Or the name of the Oh, guy. my God. Uh, oh, I mean, the guy's name was Marty Rim. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I have a fun... Uh, are you talking about the subheading that I have yeah, for that yeah, section? Yeah. The, the, the Rim the job. The Rim job. Of course. <laughs> yeah, I mean, how can you not? You can't leave that on the table. I know. It's too good. And my editor let me get away with too much. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a book about fucking on the internet. I mean... All right. Um, yeah. Like, what, are, mean, what, are, what are you going to do? Yeah, I mean, it's, it is... We got we to gotta make some puns every now and then. But yeah, also, the... Sorry, I also love on the yeah. Time cover, I'm going to pull it up again here, that uh, and read it. Um, exclusive, a new study shows how pervasive and wild it really is. Can we protect our kids and free speech? Also back then, uh, this tension about free speech and what can and can't be said on the internet is also a big part of this conversation, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it was huge. I mean, it's been something that um, has been that's been a really, that is really the, the kind of continuing conversation since the very beginning, um, which is so interesting and has huge implications for adult content on the internet. But yeah. All right. Cyber listeners, we're going to pause there for a break. If you are watching the live stream, we'll, we, will, we will be back immediately. If you're listening to the podcast, uh, please have a word from our sponsor. All right, cyber listeners, you are back on. Uh, I am Matthew Galt. We are sitting here with Samantha Cole. We are talking about her new book, How Sex Changed the Internet and How the Internet Changed Sex, which I think is a super fascinating, um, I don't know, is it a subtitle? Because you've got a subtitle too. Second part of the second A long part, ass title is it's what It's a long ass title. <laughs> so how did internet change sex? I know that's a big question. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's a big enough question to write a book about it, I guess. Um, I mean, it changed. I think, yeah, I think the the two sides of that coin um, for kind of what I was trying to explore in this, um, because it did. Uh, obviously, it's very obvious that the Internet, um, this sex changed the Internet, but like for the Internet to change sex is maybe a little more tricky to prove in like a real way. Um, but I think it changed just the way that we talk about and connect with other people and express our sexuality. Um, I mean, a big part of my reporting at Motherboard is, you know, looking into communities that uh, find each other through kink or through fetish and um, want to kind of have that thing in common and have other people say, you're not alone in being into that particular thing. Um, so I think that's a really big way that the internet has changed sex. Um, not so much that even that, you know, people are different in the ways that they're having sex, which I think they are. Like, I think people find a new uh, thing to be into a lot of the times through the internet <laughs> and then make that kind of part of their, their sexual expression. But um, being able to kind of um, express yourself in a way that maybe you haven't been comfortable doing before um is i think a huge huge way that the internet has changed our sex and our sexuality yeah i mean it used to be that if you were into say slime girls which is something that you've written about yeah. um you might be the only person in your town that was into it and you kept it secret yeah um and you you watched the anime that you could get a hold of mm -hmm. and maybe doodled in your journal and that was it <laughs> and now you can find your community online there are yeah. thousands of other people like you Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, you're not going to like, there's no way to kind of, to access that. I mean, there, 
there are limited ways to access that in real life. You know, you can't just like walk into your grocery store and be like, has anyone read the latest like slime girl manga? <laughs> um, that would probably get you kicked out of most spaces. <laughs> um, but you can do that on like a message board for, you know, specific kinks or um, you can just kind of put that out there and people will find you, which I think is really lovely. Um, I think that people talk about the internet and sex in kind of a nefarious way a lot of the times very scandalous um but i think the ways that the the good has outweighed the bad quite a bit in my opinion i think so too i think that the one of the fundamental things the internet has done um and i think this is something that scares the hell out of people is that it allows you to figure out who you are yeah. very fast in mm -hmm. a way that may have taken your entire life beforehand um yeah. And I think a lot of what we see in a lot of the pushback on people uh, now, especially around sex and the internet, I think especially the trans community from from older and more conservative people is like this is the way the we, we've got this interconnectivity now that allows people to figure out who they are and to pursue that in a really yeah. passionate way. And um, that's scary for people who want to kind of control the way that you live. Yeah, ab absolutely. And we we're <laughs> sorry, like hitting my mute button back and forth real fast. No, you're uh, fine. <laughs> yeah, it's just it's so like, I mean, yeah, I think that opening um, your world up to new and different things, I think, is very scary for people who want you to um, express yourself and conduct yourself in a way that uh, they want you to. Um, so being able to uh, criticize and analyze that in a, on a personal level, I think, is a huge huge positive um and you know a, a point on the side of the internet and sex being good <laughs> yeah. uh have you ever played a multi-user dungeon no i haven't i am so like i haven't and i wish i tried to get into like there are some that still run um and i tried to get into them and it was difficult and i kind of it's so shameful that i gave up um, I'm sure once I got in there, it would be like two people and four of them are asleep. <laughs> yeah. I kind of, I don't know how much of that is still around, but yeah. can you, uh, for people that have no idea what the hell we're talking about, what are muds and moos and, and all of this kind of thing? Um, yeah. So multi-user dungeon or domain, if you want to be safe for work. Although I think dungeon came from Dungeons and Dragons. I think of it as like a BDS thing. <laughs> Thing. No, it was absolutely because I because I was doing this when I was a kid. I was in the muds, and so it was yeah. a lot of them were just like strictly. It was big kind of dungeons that people had made. They're all text based, and some yeah. nasty art there too. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, yeah. The I mean, you could describe this better than I could because you were there. But I did research a lot of research about it um, through people who were there for the book. Um, yeah, they're role-playing spaces uh, where you can kind of describe yourself via text. It's all text-based. You can describe yourself via text. Um, and then, you know, just chat with other people um, in a more real-time way than, like, a bulletin board system, which is more like you send your post. This is like you're interacting um, with the people in the room with you. Um, yeah, I'm so kind, of, you, kind of thinking of how, like, so you would... You would like log in and you would have a character and sometimes some of them were just basically up jump chat rooms and some yeah. of them were like you had character sheets and stats and there were thing, like, mm -hmm. things to fight in there. Uh, but you would, it was all text based um, and you were going through what looked like a, a like a, a Telnet, I think Telnet was the program we used. Um, yeah. And so it was like white text on a black screen, looked like a DOS prompt and you would go mm -hmm. in be like, all right, walk into this room. And then you would walk in and the, it would describe the library to you. Yeah. Um, and you would get like a list of the people that are in there. And then you could like type, look at, you know, whoever. And it would just, would read out the description or put as text, the description for you for that person. Yeah. Right. So yeah. This was yeah. And then you can kind of manipulate objects in the room. If it was a uh, moo, which is mud object oriented. And um, you, know, you could like be like, the different commands were different for everything, but you know, that's how we ended up with like, um, uh, like Oregon trail on like those games where, you know, you're, you have the picture then, but like you're doing the same actions. You're like, you know, pick up whatever, like move, sit on, you know, lay down. Like <laughs> it varied for every, you know, every dungeon, but 
And it was also, there was something we lost when we moved to the text, from, from the text to the image. Yeah. Uh, where things are, like the, the high fidelity graphics are wonderful and it's nice to have all this interaction, but there was a kind of freedom in that simple text-based space that, that we lost when everything became based on the image. And I kind of don't know how to articulate that. Because yeah. the, limits, the limits of the moo and the mud were your imagination and the, ima- and the imagination of the creator you were interacting with. And that was it. Exactly. Yeah. And it's that's so much richer than being told to that what this thing is. You know, it's like the difference between like reading a book and then you go watch the movie and the, you're like, I'm so disappointed in that movie because it's not what I thought it was going to be in the book. Because what's in your mind is always going to be way better than what someone else tells you it looks like or acted sounded like. Um, and yeah, people got really, really involved and really emotionally involved in MUDs. Um, and really and, dirty. Know, and really dirty. And really dirty. Um, <laughs> a lot of, you know, like cyber sex happening in those. Um, cause you could go to like people's private like spaces and then not be in the, um, in the big chat and you could get like, say, I'm going to go to that person's room and then admin could see what you were doing, but like, you know, you kind of hope that they're not watching or you don't care enough. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. One of them, I don't think we can do this story live, uh, but there is a story about Lambda Mu in the book. Mm -hmm. Um, that I thought was really fascinating and gets into all these questions about consent and crime um, and is about an evil clown that does something real fucked up in one of these spaces. Um, And I'd never, this is again, it's one of these little stories that I'd never heard. And, you know, I was there, I was in those spaces and I was like, this is absolutely fascinating and grotesque. um, Mm -hmm. And I'm glad I know about it now, but how awful. Uh, So it's in, it's in the early part of the book. When you buy it and read it as you should or listen to the audiobook, uh, uh, be looking for that. Um, yeah. Uh, so let's move on to this moment when we leave text behind and go to the image. Who was, is it Lena? Um, I think it was Lena. Right. Swedish, right? Yeah. I'm, I'm actually... Not, I'm not going to attempt the last name. Uh, yeah, don't, I did have never tried to say it out loud, but yeah, um, she, she, uh, was a Playboy centerfold, um, in 1972, she was the centerfold Miss November or something. Um, but she had this really like lovely, tasteful, uh, you know, full spread. I have the, actually I should have pulled it out for this show. I have the play. I got it from eBay when I was researching this cause I was like, I must see this in person. Um, but she's, you know, wearing like a boa hat and kind of flirtily like looking over her shoulder nude. Um, so she kind of did that gig and then was like, that was cool. I'm not going to do that again. It's fine. Went and did other stuff. Um, but then, uh, years later, um, she, someone in a computer lab was trying to develop image processing for, you know, um, yeah, so the the standards for image processing so that they could kind of be able to develop these things across different labs and ha- be on the same page. And they had pictures of like fruit and boring stuff, um, but they needed like something with more interest, like skin tones and lighting and things like that. So someone brought in a Playboy. Um, <laughs> it's like, oh my God, that's perfect. Like that's colorful. It's got, you know, all these different colors in it and it's very um high quality and we can scan it in to our system and then uh base our um processing development on this and it became the standard for years um you know all of the image processing that was happening was often based on being able to uh reproduce lena um and all the while she was just like living her life didn't know this was happening until years and years later uh, when she right, was like, people, invited to a conference. Yeah, yeah. People walked up to her on the street and were like, I can't, oh, this is you in real life. I didn't know you were real. Yeah. So, yeah, right? Yeah. Which I think is so funny to say to a model. It's like, yeah. I didn't know you were a real person. It's like, what? <laughs> yeah, I mean, You that, have my photo. <laughs> therein lies like the root of all sorts of issues with uh, pornography and images of women uh, online and yeah. otherwise, right? Yeah. It's like, these are real people. Uh, 
and like I think that dovetails nicely into kind of another story about how the internet infrastructure was built by pornography and pioneered by sex workers. Uh, tell us about the rise of the cam girl. Yeah, so I mean, the cam, uh, the webcam was probably the biggest invention. I, I mean, in my opinion, you know, one of the biggest inventions that, in my biased opinion, um, that we have seen, you know, in our generation. I'll go as far as to say that uh, we had the the little like um, I don't know if you have ever had like the little Logitech, like the little bubble webcam, um, but. Those were, I guess those came out, when did that came out? That was like the 90s. Um, but they uh, opened up this huge new world to people who were already using the internet. And then they could kind of use the internet to watch other people do nothing <laughs> a lot of the times. This was like the age of reality TV. Um, so just watching people go about their day was a big genre and a big use of the webcam. And then, of course, their day often included sex or having someone over or you know you kind of hope that you like catch this like life streamer changing or something very much like the predecessors of um streaming today where you're just kind of like watching someone talk about their day um very mundane but of course that quickly became a sex thing where people were specifically using it to uh you know sell subscriptions to websites that you could then watch um, them do go about their day or specifically watch them have sex or, um, you know, early cam girls. So yeah, the, the importance of the webcam can't be overstated. I mean, we're doing this on a webcam, so it's like right. all of our lives are on a webcam. <laughs> yeah. We couldn't do our jobs. We couldn't do the show without <laughs> that bit of technology and right. it probably wouldn't have been successful if sex workers and women, normal people buying thousand millions of them in the nineties. Yeah. Right. Yeah, uh, yeah, and yeah, using it for sex definitely popularized it in a huge way. Um, so, and there all. is yeah. kind of dovetailing on this. There's this moment in the '90s also when, um, when like this stuff is all happening, and women kind of some of the women in the industry kind of recognize that it's happening and capitalize on it and like get mm -hmm. really good at tech. Uh, yeah. Can you talk about the nerds with breasts and? the early credit, the, the like early credit card stuff that we start seeing bubbling up there. Yeah. Yeah. The, that's, um, that's a quote from, um, Danny Ash. She was one of the biggest, uh, webcam porn or she wasn't doing webcam stuff. She was doing just like her own porn site. She was, she was her own porn, like, um, I don't even know business, uh, huge business. Um, she called herself, she was just like, I'm an, just a nerd with big breasts. <laughs> I love that quote so much. Um, but, uh, these people who kind of got their start a lot of the times through BBS or, you know, chain, like exchanging nudes and doing it as a hobby, um, then got into selling access to that kind of thing because there was such a demand for it. Um, and I talked to a few people who were doing it for free for a long time and would just like loved, um, building that kind of community where people were fans of their work um, and where they were scanning their own like Polaroids in to upload to the internet. Um, and then they were like, we can't actually sustain this because we need to pay our light bills and our internet bills. <laughs> um, so they turned it into businesses. And then from there, those businesses turned into like some of the biggest technologies that we use today. Um, a lot of like affiliate marketing is from link directories for porn. Um, a lot of like advertising tech comes from porn, uh, things like click through rates and stuff like that. Like they needed a way to kind of figure out how to um, make money on this so that they could keep doing it basically. Cause they really love doing it. Um, and yeah, it was a huge, huge, huge business for a lot of the internet and for a lot of people. And it opened up, I mean, the internet opened up a way for people to access that kind of opportunity without having to like go through a middleman, go through like agents or um, studio system uh, bullshit, you know, things like that. Uh, right. It was safer and the performer had control. Yeah. They had control over all of their own work. They had their own creative control, their own 
uh, rights to their own stuff. Um, so it was just really revolutionary to be able to do that kind of thing out of your own house. And I want to flash forward now because I think this is important and kind of speaks to where we are now. There is, this is something you've written about quite a bit. Um, if you are doing this kind of work online now, even if like it's attached to a very legitimate website, um, there's credit card issues, yeah. right? It's, it's getting harder to get paid. Mm -hmm. What the hell's going on and why? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the... The stuff that's going on right now with um, these groups that are trying to basically wipe porn and sex from the internet um, and demonize it and call it, you know, the worst thing that's ever happened um, are putting pressure on banks and financial institutions to shut down sites that um, are, you know, venues for people's whole livelihoods. So um, that's something that we were seeing more and more. Uh, we saw it happen with even like OnlyFans when they tried to get rid of explicit content. The reason was because they were under pressure from, or they said was because they were under pressure from uh, banks. Um, and that's something that a lot of smaller sites can't survive and haven't survived. Um, so yeah, it's um, that's banks have always been averse to high risk things. You know, it's like they call sex and porn high risk. Um, and it's in the same category as like gambling and guns and stuff. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's always been an issue, but lately it's just been supercharged. It's so much, uh, harder to stay online, uh, if you're running one of these sites. So yeah, yeah. It's it feels like it's part of this thing that, that Edward and I have talked about a couple of times on the show, this like flattening and corporatization of the online space. Mm -hmm. um, as more of this money has rolled in and more mainstream people have, have piled in um, a little bit of the souls being pushed out yeah. and the early pioneers, the people that build all this infrastructure are also being pushed out. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's exactly what's happening. <laughs> Do you think it like, and yet we also have on the other side, uh, like the Tumblr, Tumblr news. What do you, what do you mm. make of this? Yeah. So the, you're talking about the news that they are going to allow nudes again. Right. This like, <laughs> like Tumblr was like, uh, I think famously a very horny space yeah. on the internet. Um, and when they decided they, what did they do? They, Yahoo sold them and the new buyers were like no more fucking and yeah. kind of just killed it. Now yeah. as, as Twitter is waning, Tumblr said, Hey, guess what? You can post your nudes again. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I think that uh, you, you can post nudes, but you can't still can't post porn or explicit content, which I think is such an interesting line to try to draw. I mean, all of these platforms have very, uh, you know, their, their terms vague. of service are very vague. Yeah. And very, um, uh, subjective, like you, you know, it's, um, you know, it's in the eye of the beholder, what's explicit or what is offensive or, um, all these other kind of terms that they have in the, in the terms of service. But with Tumblr, they're like, you can put nudes on here again, but only if they're not explicit pornographic nudes. Um, so you can have nudes, but don't get horny from them, which I think it's interesting. I mean, I, I think that they have, they see what's happening with Twitter. Um, they see the implosion happening there. And I don't really know if it was like an intentional, like we're going to jump in on this chance and, you know, see if people will come back if we give them this kind of like peace offering. Um, but it's, I think it's smart to time it that way. If they did do it that way, either way, even if it's coincidental, I think it's really going to bring people back or at least make people log back in. Maybe they haven't in a while. I certainly did. I haven't logged into Tumblr in a really long time. Um, and I was like, let me see if there's like suddenly tons of nudes. <laughs> and was there, um, how, how was it? When no, you looked there, I mean, I need to like, I need to refresh my follows. Like I'm following all the wrong people now. <laughs> They've long since they abandoned the site because everyone did when Tumblr got rid of, um, you know, not safe for work stuff, but they got rid of the not safe for work stuff be because, and they won't bring it fully back because of, um, the issues with the banks and how hard it is to stay afloat as a website 
when you're dealing with that, you're being shut down from the major financial institutions won't let you do commerce with them. Um, but you know, they'll give a little bit, you can have a little female presenting nipple as a treat. (laughs) Who are the groups that are putting the pressure on the banks? Um, I mean, it's like conservative, um, religious groups by and large anti-trafficking groups that say they're anti-trafficking, but don't actually want to solve any of the issues of trafficking. Like, you know, um, no systemic issues in like income, uh, instability or housing instability, um, domestic abuse, all of these good things that are much harder to solve than like shutting down a website. Right. Um, yeah. Um, all right. What do you think as we're coming to the end of our conversation here, what do you think the future of fucking on the internet is and (laughs) what are the innovations that are going to drive? What are the sexual innovations that are going to drive the next phase of the internet? Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, that's such a hard question to answer and it always is. Um, I feel like I have been asked that a lot and I still don't have like a neat answer. Um, because I don't think anybody ever expected anything that's going on now to be going on 30 years ago. (laughs) Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of promise in, um, the, the live spaces that we're seeing like VR chat, even though people people aren't into vr you can do a lot of these kind of platforms through just desktop use um so you can be in a space with other people without having a big heavy headset on your face um and people in vr chat are doing some crazy crazy shit with like sex mods and things like that (laughs) yeah i mean it's the real metaverse that's where the interesting metaverse is happening i know you've written about this too right Mm -hmm. it's like I, i i thought it was so fascinating and i think we've talked about this that uh, the original version of Mark Zuckerberg's metaverse, no, there was nothing below the crotch. Yeah, was, it was just floating. Or nothing below the waist. It was so telling to me. Yeah, yeah. It's like, you know, it's... They're, they're, I don't even think they like are considering that people will try to have sex in, in their platform. <laughs> and they will. I'm sure they already are. Uh, even though Facebook is extremely anti-anything sexual. Instagram also... Um, but I think those kind of spaces are promising because they get back to kind of that, that immediate interaction. It's like, you can post something to Twitter, you can post something to Instagram and you're not really having that same kind of like live feedback from another person, um, as you might in a space like, um, VR chat or even like Roblox, like people are doing just interesting things in all of these, um, you know, they call them virtual reality spaces, but you don't have to have the, the headset to do all that stuff. Um. Yeah, I think that's probably where I would go if I had to wager a bet. But it'll be something completely left field. Like, (laughs) I can't guess, honestly. If I could, I would be a billionaire. But But I bet you'll be there to report on it. Yeah. All right, Samantha Cole, thank you so much for coming on to Cyber. We need to let everybody go. And thank you for tuning into the stream. Where can people find the book, Sam? Um, you can find it anywhere. Books are sold. You can find it on Amazon. You can find it on Bookshop. Um, you can go to my Twitter, Sam Lee Cole, and find it there. Um, I never shut up about it, so. And it's you know. out November fifteenth. Is that right? Yep, next so week. Five days. Um, yeah. Thank you, everybody, for tuning into the stream. Uh, if you are listening to the podcast, we do the, we do do these as a live stream. You can follow us at youtube.com forward slash motherboard or at twitch.tv forward slash motherboard. Follow us there and you'll be notified when we go live. We really appreciate you. Uh, Great audience interaction as always. And we will be back uh, next week. I think we're going to be talking to Aaron Gordon uh, about some not in my backyard stuff. Uh, I believe. believe. We will see you next week. Thank you all so much. Goodbye.